So, welcome student to the next class of introduction to nonlinear optics and your application course. So, in the previous class we have started uh, one important concept and that is uh, optical parametric oscillator and this is uh, basically a device uh, through which you, we can amplify a light. So, some sort of laser kind of things, but the principle is slightly different that we have discussed. But this amplification process is mainly generated due to the non-linearity of the crystal that is used as a active material here. And then the light is bounced back from two mirrors and then we increase uh, the intensity of a signal or idler. The signal or idler are mainly generated due to the non-linear process, this non-linear frequency mixing from a given pump. But before starting to today's class, I would like to uh, mention one uh, important thing that we have done in the last class. There was one uh, typing mistake I would like to mention. So, please see this equation. So, which is uh, written here, uh, Ez uh, the solution of, uh, we were trying to discuss about how the uh, signal will going to evolve. And then I noticed that there is a slight typing mistake. And uh, this typing mistake uh, I like to mention here, please note carefully that uh, we wrote the solution here A sin hyperbolic B cos hyperbolic which is uh, this and this. So, this is uh, not the incorrect solution, this is in fact the correct solution, but whatever the boundary condition I put here that at E is equal to 0, A is equal to these things, this is wrong, this is wrong. So, that is why you should please note that uh, the exact solution will be this. In place of sin, we should have A cos hyperbolic Gz plus B sin hyperbolic Gz. Then these things, these solutions and the boundary conditions are correct. So, just make these slight changes uh, when you study. So, please note that there is a slight mistake here. So, I, I noticed that that is why I thought I should explain once again. Apart from that, uh, the other boundary conditions are same. Okay, so, let me go back to uh, today's topic. Today, we will going to understand what is doubly resonating oscillator or doubly resonant oscillator DRO. So, in optical parametric oscillator, we have already discussed SRO. SRO is a, a system where we can amplify so, we can amplify a particular frequency, in this case the frequency is omega s and as a result as a parametric process omega i will going to generate, omega i is an idler wave. So, on, only signal is going to resonate, but uh, the mirror, the reflectivity mirror is fixed in such a way that this omega s will make a round trip, the field associated with omega s is make a round trip and it will going to amplify accordingly. But for doubly resonant oscillator what happened is both the field associated with, with frequency omega s and omega i will going to amplify. So, here instead of vibrating one particular wavelength or frequency we have two wavelengths that will going to resonate together. So, signal and idler both will going to resonate. So, since both are going to resonate or both are going to uh, make an oscillation, so we call it uh, a doubly resonate oscillator or DRO. So, the essentially the difference between these two in uh, singly resonate oscillator only one wavelength will going to oscillate and we call this wavelength as or the frequency as omega s or signal frequency, but in doubly uh, generate uh, resonant oscillator uh, instead of amplifying one uh, frequency, we can amplify two different frequencies that will going to generate from the pump. But for both the cases, the condition, the primary condition omega p is equal to omega s plus omega i that will remain same. So, omega s and omega i 
together generate omega p that is the pump. So, omega s and omega i both will going to be feeded by the giving pump and in both the processes this equation remain conserved, this equation is true. Well, let me remind you what we have in SRO. In SRO, we have one particular field that is going to vibrate as shown here in this figure. If the cavity length is L, if I say this is a cavity, cavity length is L and the reflectivity of the two mirror is R1 and R2, then we can able to find out what is the condition what is the condition for generating this, uh, 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 this, this amplifying this particular uh, frequency omega s. And the g value which is uh, related to the pump amplitude or the pump intensity, it should have a threshold value and this threshold value should be equal to this root over of 2 divided by L, 1 divided by root over R1 R2 minus 1 whole to the power half. So, once we have this value, then we can from here calculate what is the corresponding threshold value of the pump intensity so that I can amplify this signal field E s, signal field E s. In doubly resonate oscillator in DRO as I mentioned, two field which is associated with frequency omega s and omega i signal and idler both will going to amplify. So, omega s and omega i these two field E s or E i in terms of uh, field notation. So, there should be few modes that will going to vibrate. So, we know that these modes can be calculated by the boundary conditions or the conditions that we imposes and in a cavity we always do that, that if this is a cavity there are few modes that will going to vibrate and there is some boundary condition and this is for example, this optical length L multiplied by N, this length has to be the length of the integer lambda by 2 because if you see that here we have mode where these two points are fixed points. So, this, this is the frequency that will going to vibrate inside uh, this cavity and that is why we will going to generate this kind of equation. And from this kind of equation one can have the value of lambda for which it will going to vibrate. There are other modes also possible for example, this is a mode that will also going to vibrate, this is another mode that also going to vibrate. So, these are the typical figures of the mode in a cavity where these two points are fixed point and for these two fixed points we can have uh, the amplitude 0 and this is the condition to have the modes for which uh, it will going to vibrate. Now, if I apply this condition, then we will going to find out the explicit value of the frequency omega s and omega i. This frequency omega s and omega i are now depends on some integers m and p. So, for different values of m we will have different modes that will go into vibrate or in principle that are allowed modes that will going to oscillate. For omega i also I can uh, find out a similar kind of expression and only change if you notice is here in the refractive index. Pi is a constant, C is a constant, L is a cavity length which is also constant. Only thing that will going to change in those these two cases are the corresponding refractive index because refractive index of the frequency omega s and the refractive index of the frequency omega i they are not same, they are different. So, all cases in these two cases 
these are the allowed mode that will going to vibrate inside the cavity. But this equation has to be maintained each and every time. That is one thing and also one can from this expression one can find out one thing that is what is the frequency spacing between two modes because two modes will going to vibrate and if I want to find out what is the corresponding frequency spacing then we can write it as omega delta omega s is basically omega s m plus 1 minus omega s m which is m plus 1 pi c n s l minus m pi c n s l and from these two we can have pi c n s l. This is the frequency spacing between two oscillatory mode, two oscillatory mode that is allowed. So, there are many oscillatory modes that would be there in, in this cavity and for this modes there is a corresponding frequency spacing and this frequency spacing is represented by pi c divided by NLS. So, this is the frequency spacing between two corresponding modes. So, now C value is constant which we know 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second, pi is also constant 3.14, NAC is the refractive index of the material. So, if it is a nonlinear crystal, a different kind of nonlinear crystal has different refractive index. So, suppose it is 2.1 or 2.3 and L is a value say few centimeters, then putting all this value one can understand what should be the frequency spacing between these two modes that are allowed to vibrate. So, this calculation is easy and one can understand that what should be the order of this frequency spacing by just putting a suitable value here. L is order of centimeter as I mentioned. So, delta omega s is equal to pi c n s l c is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second n s is of the order of say 2.1 l is a length which is say few centimeters say 1 centimeter order and then if I put and pi is 3.14 if I put these things here then we can readily find out what should be the uh, frequency spacing and uh, unit wise also you can see that c is a unit of meter per second pi and n is dimensionless, l is a unit of meter. So, meter meter will cancel out, we will have in the unit in terms of hertz. So, the next that we will going to find is operational mechanism in DRO. So, let us understand the left hand figure what we are uh, showing that once uh, the pump is launched here, the signal and idler, the signal and idler are generated, pump is launched and signal and idler are generated. When the signal and idler are generated that means it should grow from a value input value and both are amplified. So, that is the thing the so, signal and idler both are resonant and they are going to generate inside the system and they will generate from a given initial value. If the given initial value is E s 0 for this case that is at z equal to 0 and E i 0 that is at z equal to 0. So, both of these things are going to evolve. So, E s is a function of z and E i is also a function of z and both will going to evolve. So, this evolution we need to find out uh, what should be the equation of this evolution. Both the cases again how these two frequencies will generate will be governed by this master equation omega p is equal to omega s plus omega i. In order to understand how these two fields will going to evolve inside the material nonlinear material which will going to use 
as active material in DRO, we need to just solve these two differential equations that we have been solving for last few classes. These two differential equation is under the condition delta k is equal to 0. So, delta k is equal to 0 is the condition for which I can write these two equations. And now, d2 e s dj square is i k s e p multiplied by the derivative of this quantity and this derivative of this quantity can be represented here with a star. So, that is why minus i k i e p star e s one can write this treatment we have done in the previous class also. And then we will find kappa s kappa i e p square e s which is a constant this portion is a constant and finally, we come to this equation that we have shown in the previous class also. So, this is the evolution equation of E s. Now, in this particular situation we need to put some boundary condition and this boundary condition basically give us the idea how these two fields are generated. So, if I write the solution please note the solution as I mentioned at the beginning of the class the solution is a cos hyperbolic plus b sin hyperbolic uh, g z this is a general solution. So, if we consider this is a general solution then in the next we will like to put the boundary condition to figure out what is a and b. The boundary condition is this problem is slightly different because if you carefully note uh, what is going on then uh, we can see this is the structure E p is generated and E s and E i E p is launched and E s and E i is generated and this is z equal to 0 point and z equal to l point. At z equal to 0 what happened E s 0 is non-zero and E i 0 is also non-zero. So, they should have some value. This value I call E s 0 at z equal to 0 and E i 0 at z equal to 0. So, both the cases we find the input value is non-zero. Since E s and E i both at 0 at z equal to 0 point, the solution the form of the solution is slightly different that we have achieved in our the previous class. So, here we will calculate in detail. So, this is my solution boundary condition E s at z equal to 0 suggests that it is equal to E s 0 which is equal to A and this is my E s 0. This is first. Second thing is E i 0 is E i 0 that means, at z equal to 0 the value of idler field is E i 0. If I want to find b then what uh, we should do we should make a derivative and find out what is the value at z equal to 0 of the derivative the standard procedure when we do then we put this value and this value basically give me one expression b g because when I make a derivative of this quantity and put z equal to 0 then the term associated with cos will cancel out the term associated with b gives me b g and when I put g equal to z equal to 0 the cos term here which is coming after derivative will cancel out and we will get b g is equal to i kappa e p and e i 0 star. So, b is basically this quantity and this quantity. So, 1 divided by g multiplied by i kappa is e p e i 0 star. Since e i is e i at z equal to 0 is non 0, we will have b is a non 0 term. If you remember the previous calculation that how E s will going to evolve in this kind of parametric process, then it is simply a cos hyperbolic of g z. It is just this kind of expression we derived. But in that case we considered that E i was not there at z equal to 0 point, but since E i is there 
So, our solution will be simply this E s 0 sin hyperbolic z z plus i root over of kappa s kappa i this. So, a and b I evaluate and we find a most general solution which is this again I am making a mistake this has to be cos hyperbolic and this has to be sin hyperbolic according to the solution. So, E is 0 as a general solution and in the similar way in the similar way we can also find the solution for E s uh, for E i. After having the solution for E s we can readily find out what is the solution of E i and there are two way to find out. One way is to directly solve this equation because E s at z point is known I just put E s and then make a uh, integration and I find E i that is one procedure to do that. And another procedure is that we have just followed to calculate E s. So, the procedure that we will going to follow is same. Only thing is instead of making a derivative for E s I will make a derivative from E i. So, when you make a derivative from E i, so this two derivative gives me i k i e p and this derivative and this is the derivative for that. So, the second order derivative of E i will exactly give us the expression that we had for E s with the same g. E p is constant, so we can consider this as a constant. So, this is a positive quantity, g is a positive quantity and we will get this. Again the solution can be represented in terms of c cos hyperbolic g z plus d cos hyperbolic uh, g z as a general solution. Only thing is the constants are now change c and d are the constants it is previously used at a and b and it is now changed. So, once we do this the next thing is to put the boundary condition and once I put the boundary condition exactly the similar process that we have done in the previous calculation. So, E i at comes out to be d because when I put z equal to 0 then this quantity will not be there and cos hyperbolic will be 1 at z equal to 0. So, d will be the value at E i z equal to 0 point. So, this is a constant and I find d equal to E i 0. E s 0 is E s 0, E s at z equal to 0 is E s 0 that we also considered uh, in the previous calculation and then d s d z at z equal to 0 that is the derivative. When I make a derivative of this I will have i kappa s e p e s 0 star and c z is equal to this quantity because when I make a derivative of this quantity this quantity become d e i d z if I make a derivative it, it will be C z cos hyperbolic of g z plus d g sin hyperbolic of g z. So, cos hyperbolic and sin hyperbolic these two terms these two terms at z equal to 0 if I put z equal to 0 will become C z and uh, Will, will become C z because this quantity will vanish. So, at z equal to 0 this term will 0, this term will 1 and that is why you get C z which is equal to this. So, finally, if you do the all this calculation we will come to one expression similar to E s and this is our total expression of E i. So, E i z will going to evolve in this way. E i 0 cos hyperbolic z z plus i this. So, it follows all the boundary conditions and I will get. So, now E s and E i the explicit form of both these two fields are now known to us. So, let us now summarize whatever the calculation we have. 
So, the summarize calculation suggest that if I launch an EP inside the system, then what happened? So, if I launch an EP inside the system, then what happened? We will have the evolution of ES and EI. The ES and EI, the solution is written in this form. So, if you if you see carefully, then we will find that in one case, so this is my EI, EI is related to ES star and ES is related to EI star. So, I can make EI star so that I will get this EI star here. And from this solution, I can write a matrix form of ESZ EIZ that means this is what is the, whatever the field of ES and EI at Z point and it is related to what what is the field at Z equal to 0. So, if I know the value of this point, I can know the value of this point of ES and EI with this matrix form. We just simply need to, so if I make a vector form, so ES and EI are forming a vector, I write E bar which is equal to sum M which is this matrix E bar 0. That means, this is the relation between the pair of field ES and EI that is generating into the system due to this nonlinear process and we can write this in terms of this matrix form. Well, after having this matrix form, the next thing is I can confine this matrix in this way. So, if I confine this matrix in this way, just re replace the name of the terms say A equal to D equal to cos hyperbolic, B is equal to sin hyperbolic and C is this quantity. So, I can write in this uh, these things in this compact matrix form. So, A, B, C, D is my transformation matrix that can transform the field from 0 to Z point. Well, finally, what is going on here is a very interesting that this field is generating here and make a round trip, this field is generating here and make a round trip. Since these two field is make a round trip, if we want to find out what is my round trip field, then we need to multiply the reflection matrix of the system also. So, my goal here is to find out the field starting from here from this point to coming here. So, how this field will going to evolve can be multi uh, can be understood by the matrix multiplication. So, how these things are happening? So, let us try to understand. So, from here to this point, from this point to this point, if I say this is process 1, in process 1, the field is associated with the initial field with this matrix 1, which we have already derived. Then there is a, then there is a reflection, the field, there is a reflection of the field, I call this process 2. So, this is the reflection matrix we know that the field is reflected then what should be the value of the new field can be represented in terms of reflection matrix. So, this is process 2 where the reflection matrix is shown that if I multiply this whatever the value we have with the reflection matrix then I will get the field after reflection. Then the field goes from here to here which is process 3. We know that in process 3 since the phase matching condition delta k is not equal to 0. So, that means the phase matching condition is not valid. So, there will be no change of the field at all. So, whatever the field we have at this point, the same field we will going to have this point. So, if I make a transformation, then there should be say unit matrix to transfer these two fields. That means, whatever the field we have, if I multiply the unit matrix, I will have the same field here, the pair of same field. And then finally, there is a reflection here also at a 4 point. So, it will reflect and now start for the next trip. So, this reflection I can do with 4. So, at the end of the day I have 1, 2, 3, 4, this 1, 2, 3, 4 are the 4 matrix and this 4 matrix are now multiplied together and when this 4 matrix are multiplied together, I can have the field at exactly the round trip position. So, today we will have this expression in our hand. So, tomorrow in the next class 
we will do the calculation with this matrix form and try to find out what is the condition for the threshold for doubly uh, resonate oscillator. So, today we just find out the operational condition and how the fields are evolving inside the doubly resonant oscillator. In the singly resonant oscillator, we have single equation, but here we should have two equations and to handle with these two equation, we use the matrix form, which is more convenient and in this matrix form, we have what is the field relationship between the fields that is at input and after making one round trip. So, four matrices are used and we have a compact form and this form we will be using in the next class to find what is going on in terms of the amplification of the signal and idler inside DRO. So, with this note let me conclude here. So, see you in the next class and thank you for your attention.